Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is synchronicity and serendipity. With me is Dr. Bernard Beitman, who is the former chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Missouri in Columbia. He is internationally known for his research into the relationship between chest pain and anxiety disorder. He has edited two volumes of psychiatric annals that focus on coincidences, and he also produces a regular blog for Psychology Today and also a podcast on connecting with coincidence. He is the author of Connecting with Coincidence, the new science of using synchronicity and serendipity for your life. His other books include Integrative Psychiatry, The Structure of Individual Psychotherapy, Self-Awareness Deficits in Psychiatric Patients, Learning Psychotherapy, and Counseling and Psychotherapy Essentials. Once again, this is an internet interview, and now I'll switch over to the internet channel. Welcome, Bernie. It's a pleasure to be with you. You've uh, had me as a guest on your podcast a couple of times, so I'm honored to have you today as a guest on New Thinking Aloud. Thank you for being with me. Oh, you're very welcome. It's a pleasure for me too, Jeff. You have focused pretty intensively on the ways in which coincidence, synchronicity, serendipity can be life-changing for some people. Well, it starts with me. I mean, I, all this stuff is just like comes out of my own experiences, like um, your Uncle Harry. I mean, these are these are life changing experiences uh, that we some of us pay attention to. And uh, the biggest one for me was when my uh, when I was eight or nine, and my came home and my dog wasn't there, and I loved that dog, and I asked my mother, "Where's Snapper?" And she said, "Go to the police station and ask them." And they didn't know. And I was tear-filled and took the wrong turn, and there was Snapper coming towards me. And I was one happy boy uh, finding that baby. Uh, I still remember the feeling of it. Uh, and it's those feelings that these coincidences engender in us that drive our memory of them as uh, so many other things. And I remember it still. I mean, he jumped up on my on my legs and was 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 saying, "Where have you been?" Pretty much. Um, and we went on. So uh, you weren't expecting to see Snapper uh, where you were near the police department, I guess. No, no. And it, the key part in thinking back was I made a wrong turn. <clears throat> and from then on, I've, I've learned how much fun it is to get lost. <laughs> well, one of the things you point out in your book is that uh, a certain type of personality you know, seems to have more good luck, uh, more positive synchronicities than than other people. And, and part of that is just the expectation that this could happen. Oh, yeah. Um, I talked to, um, on my radio show, I talked with uh, David Spiegelhalter uh, yesterday, um, he's like Sir David Spiegelhalter, professor and like renowned uh, statistician uh, at Cambridge University in, in England, and and he he just does not see coincidences. He doesn't see them. He has a website, four thousand reports of coincidences. He's very interested in them, but he says I don't see them. They they just don't happen to me. And that's a filter thing. There's a certain kind of um, mental filter, and filter theory we could get into if you want to, but just the regular filter of three-dimensional, five-sensory reality varies so much for what you see. Mm. And he just doesn't see them. And why he doesn't? It's almost like he wonders why he doesn't, but he hasn't quite gotten to the place where he wonders 
why he doesn't. He just doesn't. So I, I sent him uh, my research looking at the, the qualities of people who tend to see more coincidences. I don't know if you'll read it, but there, there is a continuum. It starts with uh, whether people define themselves as spiritual uh, or religious. The more spiritual you are, the more coincidences you see. Uh, that makes sense to somebody looking at the situation, but it's because you're looking outside of yourself, David Spiegelhalter. It's just not all statistics. That's a pretty interesting one because probably for many spiritual people who see lots of coincidences in, in their lives, uh, many times they also have the philosophy that there is no such thing as a coincidence, that every experience they have is sort of organized for them by a, a higher power of some sort. Uh, but this research suggests that uh, parapsychological uh, mechanisms aside, simply by paying attention to uh, the possibility that there may be more coincidences for perfectly normal psychological reasons, you'll find more. Right. There's something about expectation and experience. You remember a guy named George Kelly from Ohio State? No. You may not. He's an obscure psychologist. From Ohio State. And there was the young Bernie Beitman at Swarthmore College, bored, wandering the stacks, looking for something interesting. And there was this little green book with green and white on or yellow called A Theory of Personality by George Kelly. Hmm. I said, okay, I'll look at that. So his line was a person's processes are psychologically channelized by the way he anticipates events, which is a long way of saying expectation influences experience. Mm -hmm. And that is what you just said. And I just said it in a long way. If you expect it, you're more likely to see it. I mean, we, we, our lives are so determined by how we think about what's going to happen. We have these prefrontal cortices that influence the way we think about our lives in reality. And coincidence is only a, a subset of what you see if you expect. Now, it sounds like another variation of Gertrude Schmeidler's sheep-goat theory in, in parapsychology, that people who expect that they will perform well in a test of ESP actually do perform better than people who expect that uh, their scores will be normal. And in fact, it seems as if when people expect that their scores will be normal, they hover so close to the mean expectation, uh, even more so than you would expect by chance. Is there something, Jeff, about the way our minds shape reality? Is there something that you're saying there? <laughs> you might be. You might be. It, it's it, it's all in the mind, you know, said Ringo Starr. Uh, and, and, and recognizing that is like a hard thing for a lot of people to do. For David Spiegelhalter, that's not true. Mm -hmm. It's all statistical out there. So when we're talking about the spiritual people you mentioned for whom... There are no coincidences. For David Spiegelhalter, there also are no coincidences. But for entirely they're... different reasons. Right. <laughs> Well, you know, I am very interested, uh, obviously, in the parapsychological aspects oh. <laughs> of, of synchronicity and, and coincidence. And I know you have a section in, in your book about coincidences involving books. And I've actually had, uh, now you had one when you found this, this particular book in the library that was very meaningful to you when you were a student at Swarthmore. Uh, I've had people tell me that my first book, The Roots of Consciousness, on occasion when they're walking through the shelves in a bookstore, literally fall off the shelves and land on their head for, for no explicable reason. You made it happen. You're psychokinetic, are you? <laughs> one, of, one of my closest okay. friends, a person who traveled with me to Egypt, uh, is a, an individual who uh, was contemplating, should I go on this trip or should I not, when my book literally fell on their head. 
in a, in a bookstore. And that's what caused them to make that decision to, to come on this e- Egyptian journey that I was sponsoring at the time. And that was 30 years ago. We've been very close friends ever since. Wow. Wow. Well, you heard me joke about your psychokinetic, but uh, you did write the PK man. Yeah. And, and so one of the things I'm, I look at is particular talents around coincidences that people have. Are you, are you psychokinetic yourself? Are you able to move things? I don't think I am, but you know, we, because you wrote that book and you got so involved with the PK man. Yeah. I make a connection between the books falling off the shelf repeatedly, your book, and your and PKness. Yeah. And it's not it's the way I think and probably the way you think, without knowing why. But so here you, Jeff Mishlove, have involvement with a, a very interesting string of thing thing coincidences. And so it makes me look at the common denominator, which is you or your book, hmm. and wonder about how they might be connected. Now, could you explain that more carefully? A thing thing coincidence. Yeah, a thing thing coincidence is is made up of of observables of two or more observables. Uh, probably the the king of uh, of the observable seriality of things are, is Gary Schwartz at the University of Arizona, who, who just sees them all over the place. And they're like a bunch of ducks is what she's, he saw. He's, he just sent at me. But they're all observable, just like the book falling off the shelf is observable by someone else, where telepathy or I thought of a person and they called me, my thought is not observable by anybody else. Mm-hmm. And you have a string of them that you're involved with. Yeah. So I so I wonder about that. You know, Paul Kammerer, he he came up with the term seriality. Uh, he was a precursor of Jung. You, you familiar with him? No, Kammerer isn't he a, a biologist? Yeah. He he uh, he he was um, a pre, he was a Lamarckian. Arthur Kessler wrote about him. Yes, he. The, the the case of the midwife toad is right. the name of the book, book. And, and in the back uh, there's something about um, the seriality stuff that uh, that that um, Kammerer was working on. Uh, mm-hmm. it, was, it was it's been translated from the German recently. And he came up with the, the just seeing mostly two things like um, the count so and so, and then have this name and count. Uh, and, Count Showalter and then met Mrs. Showalter on a, on a plane, a different person, and then saw uh, Mrs. Showalter was invited into the doctor's office, a different one. So that was the sort of thing that Kammerer would make notes about and try to come up with a, a, a basic, a, a scientific, a current scientific way of thinking about them, that, that these things all were brought together at one time and then scattered, but then they came together sometimes. And that's the best I can describe it. But there was a, there was a, it was something like the Big Bang when it all came apart, but they're still related to each other. Now, let's explore this a little more deeply because uh, I get the impression from what you're saying that uh, Kammerer is suggesting that the synchronistic process works very much like a a patient in Freudian therapy going through a chain of associations. Yeah, and that they all come from the same place. Mm-hmm. That the associations are all coming from the same place. I didn't make that connection, but yeah, that's and that Freud was pretty popular in 1919, and that's when uh, this and he was writing in German and. Camera was in Vienna, so why not think that there was a relationship between the two of them? That there were these thoughts in the air. That's a very interesting uh, possibility. I mean, one of Freud's uh, real claims to fame is the establishment of uh, free association as a technique in psychiatry. And uh, it sounds like what Kammerer is suggesting is that the, just as the human mind seems to operate on the basis of association, uh, so does the universe. That's right. Well, I've 
prefer not to use the term universe. Uh -huh. uh, it's a little large for my little <laughs> kepi. <laughs> I can't do that one. I, I, I tend to say the psychosphere. Uh -huh. Psychosphere, I, that's a nice word, yeah. Well, thank you. It's, it's what, um, it's what I, I mean about our mental atmosphere just here on Earth, mm -hmm. that it, it could be holographic and it could apply to a much larger space like the universe. But I prefer to do my thinking within this atmosphere, which our minds more readily seem to be a part of. Mm -hmm. that, and this, that makes perfect sense to me. Thank you. And, and the, the psychosphere is filled with ideas or information and energy. And we, we use it information dash energy in lots of different ways so that what you're seeing with me and I'm seeing around you is not just a mind contained in your skull, but a mind that is connected to the psychosphere or you can call it a lot of other things, but it's, it's our mental atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And that we have capacities, as parapsychologists will agree, to, to somehow traverse, not with, there's no explanation for telepathy, we know that supposedly, but I think that we have sensors that we have not yet defined that can pick up stuff from other people's minds and from a distance. We don't know how our, how smell works very well. More recently, a third layer of the retina has been discovered. We don't really know pain and how that works. It's pretty ancient, but we don't really know how that works very well. So I'm saying that we have evidence for parapsychological experiences. We just don't know how our brains pick it up from our sensory capacities. That's one of the big mysteries. But but an even bigger mystery, I suppose, is consciousness itself. How, how does consciousness interact with the brain? It seems to be obvious that it does, and yet how it does seems to be... Uh, uh, we hardly ha have the first... Uh, the, the tiniest, most feeble understanding of it. Amen, brother. Yeah. I. How? What do you think about that, Jeff? What are you thinking about that? Well, I lately I've been leaning towards the idealistic metaphysical position that consciousness creates the brain rather than the brain creates consciousness. Uh, Consciousness, the, the brain exists within a matrix of consciousness rather than consciousness existing within the brain. It's, it's, it's so simple. It's such a simple way of thinking. It's like this is a condensed version of something that's similar around us. Yeah. The brain. It's, it, it's different levels of vibration. I, I tend to think so. But let me ask you this, Bernie. You were the chair of the psychiatry department at the University of Missouri in, in Columbia. I confess. I confess. <laughs> I, I gather you left that position some time ago. Uh, but when you were there, chair of the Department of Psychiatry, if you had voiced these ideas, how would they have been received? Um... Not well. Um, I began the, my research into coincidences on the latter part of my uh, being chair at the University of uh, Missouri, um, where I did some database research simply asking questions about who, who, who how, do, pe do people really experience coincidences? And we did a survey that got about a thousand people at the University of Missouri telling us what they got. Uh, we went through a couple of iterations to make the the survey um, statistically reliable. Uh, and from that, we got the data about who tends to see more coincidences than not. I've got uh, two issues of uh, psychiatric annals uh, dedicated to, uh, to coincidence studies. That would never happen again. The, the, it was like uh, the Red Sea opening. I, there were there was the opportunity in 2009, and then again in 2011 through some discussions uh, with the editor to try to get those in, uh, and they got in. I didn't get much response from psychiatry, um, but to be able to have in an almost legitimate journal, as it was a giveaway journal, but but 
almost legitimate journal of papers on coincidences was a big accomplishment, I think, to be able to have gotten that far with it. Now, uh, I think psychiatry might be a little more open to it. I mean, the amount of psychedelic research that's going on around the country now, that MAPS, you, you know the guys at MAPS, the, the, the group that, study, that studies psychedelic studies? Um, I just heard about them the other day from Andrew Weil. Uh, that, that, and I have a medical student working with me who wants to go do research in psychedelics. I'm saying, what? Times have changed a lot yeah. since the 1960s when it was such a bad thing to do. And that kind of pushing the boundaries of psychiatry from what was going on in the 60s, uh, I think, is helping the synchronicity ideas come along. Mm -hmm. for, in, in one way that comes along is um, I've been contacted by several people who have had manic episodes. And usually manic is bad. You got to medicate it, and it really is kind of bad. Uh, it's, it's a problematic thing, but sometimes in the mania, they get into altered states. Of, it is an altered states of consciousness, and they get into parapsychological experiences, and those are considered part of their craziness. Yeah. And so, somebody who works in New York for a big music business uh, listened to many of my shows and felt much more comfortable with her mania because I was able to validate the reality of some of her parapsychological and other synchronistic events. And I've heard that from other people listening to my radio show is that because I'm a psychiatrist, because I, 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 I have a lot of experience, I've done database research and chest pain and panic disorder, I've been a chairman of a psychiatry, all that stuff. I have a background that allows me to be able to talk about this stuff so that the, so people who are overwhelmed with coincidences, with with mania or even without mania, because some of, there are people like that who are overwhelmed, come to me and occasionally I talk with them. And one person who drove from Ohio to Charlottesville to talk with me came away from that experience is really understanding how her synchronicities were helping her manage her life in a way she could not have done before. Synchronicity is not only a spiritual path, but it's also a psychological path, which Jungians have made fairly clear, but they're kind of restrictive about it. But psycho-spiritual psycho development can be enhanced by coincidence awareness. Now, that's one of the points that you make very strongly uh, in your work, that people can actually work with these synchronicities to their own benefit. And... You know, interestingly, I took uh, the test that you have. Oh, you did? Yes. I, I scored average, perfectly average in terms of openness to coincidence. And, and yet I regard myself as a person whose whole life has been changed dramatically by these events, synchronicities. Um, but they don't occur all the time. I mean, I'm still benefiting from a synchronicity that I had in 1972. So... I don't think you necessarily need to have a lot of them. You just need a few really good ones. You betcha. <laughs> you betcha. Uh, and it's, it's usually, Jeff, the, when people have a, a big one like that, they, or a couple of them, they start, look, they start expecting more of them. Yeah. So what happened with you that that did not happen? How come you don't see like the regular ones happening around all the time? Well, you know, I do notice little ones, but they're not life-changing. Oh, you just look. Oh, you're 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 just going for the big bang ones. Ain't you? <laughs> now these other ones don't bother me. Well, well I'll okay. take whatever comes, I guess. But uh, it may I, be that what you're talking about mm -hmm. is that there's no good coincidence unless it really blows my mind. I mean, that may be <laughs> what, the way you're scanning your environment. I never thought of that, but yeah, mm. yeah that's very possible. I mean, that's what, what you're doing. It sounds like. I remember on one occasion I was reading a, a book by uh, a psychiatrist on, on uh, shamanism. And just as I was paging through that book and I came to a uh, passage on uh, synchronicity, I got a phone call from that very individual. 
and uh, ended up scheduling an interview with him as I as I recall but that was um you know those those sorts of things happen commonly, and I, I'm pretty sure a lot of spiritual traditions say that those things are signs. Uh, and they're regarded by various spiritual traditions as signs that you're on the right path, that the universe is sort of acknowledging you, but you don't need to make anything more of it than that. That is the most common use of coincidences, mm-hmm. um, the kind of encouragement or support that you're on the right path. Yeah. That, that, that's the most common, and it makes you feel like uh, there's there's somebody out there or something watching out for you. Mm-hmm. Uh, th- this uh, this ex- when you talk about reading and then getting the phone call, that's uh, sometimes called uh, telephone telepathy. That Rupert Sheldrake was like studying. Yeah, uh, I, I I think there's I had one recently where um, the um, I, I've been t- where I've been trying to talk about synchronicity uh, at my synagogue and to trying to like get somebody to let me do it. I did it a couple of years ago, but I've known, I've learned a lot since then. So I was in a slightly altered state of consciousness because I just come away from dance and I, I like to dance. And I said, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll email the rabbi. And he emails me back and said, I will, I was just about to email you because my son uh, wants to talk with you because he um, he, he uh, is a uh, he is a consultant for um, Invisibilia, the NPR uh, podcast, and he wants to talk to you about synchronicity. And I liked that one because it it made the rabbi more clearly know that there was something to what I had. So it had a kind of operational effect, um, which which that phone call did for, for you, uh, that that made you get this guy on the on the, on the phone. So there's a those are practical um, uses of coincidences. Yeah, sure. I think uh, synchronicity can be of lots of practical benefit. But I have talked to people who have uh, had. Uh, potential uh, synchronicities uh, or actual that are very negative. For example, yes, tell me uh, those. I, yes, I once talked to an individual, as I recall, was one of my psychotherapy patients who had been playing with a Ouija board and started getting messages through the Ouija board. And the, the Ouija board message said, come to a certain street corner in San Francisco where they lived and uh, at 3 a.m., because we we want to show you something. Well, the person didn't do it, but later uh, the next day or the day after, they read in the newspaper that a murder had taken place at that location at that time. So uh, it certainly suggests there's a dark side. Well, let's talk about that. Um, uh, John Lilly uh, got very much into uh, Echo, the... Uh, Earth Coincidence Control Office. Yes. Uh, and I, I love that concept. Uh, I love that he was playing, playing with that. But then he got away from it because he saw that there was evil around, too, uh, that there was negative stuff around, too. And I think it's very, very important to not just put a fine purple gloss on all coincidences, that they can be problematic. They can be used in negative ways. They can be hurtful as well as helpful. Uh, the simple examples are like uh, one coincidence is good for me, but not for you. Um, and and there, there's one story of like a, a guy uh, robbing somebody's house and getting their checkbook and uh, making out a check and going to the bank with the checkbook. And it turned out that the teller was the person he had robbed. So it's good for the teller, but not good for the robber. Yeah. That, that's, that's, a, that's a simple one. Um, but probably one of the most um, bothersome ones is the assassination of John Lennon. Um, that uh, the, the person who was thinking about killing him, um, he uh, was standing outside of um, the apartment, the Dakota, in uh, New York City. And um, he saw, um, he, and he was thinking about the Dakota, and that's where Rosemary's Baby was filmed. Mm-hmm. And um, the movie was uh, Rosemary's Baby was 
film by Roman Polanski. And Roman Polanski was had gotten shit with Sharon Tate's girlfriend, and uh, she was pregnant when um, Charles Manson's group uh, murdered her and a couple of people in in Malibu. And um, and, and Charles Manson's favorite song was Helter Skelter, um, and Helter Skelter he thought was written by John Lennon. Um, and then Mia Farrow walks by and walks into the building. And she lived near there or in the building. And he took that as a hint that he should assassinate John Lennon. Uh, that was, that's, that's the use of coincidences to encourage in the wrong direction, a terrible direction that we all still miss him. Yeah. Yeah. And I know uh, the psychiatrist Jewel Eisenbud in his book, Parapsychology and the Unconscious, points out that if an individual has a uh, personality complex that's self-destructive uh, and they happen to have psychic gifts, well, synchronicities can come in the service of self-destruction. Yep. I don't have any examples of that right now that I can think of, but it's very, very important to keep that in mind because there's such a gloss put on all the coincidences mm -hmm. uh, that you still have to look at them as road signs, not as commands. Mm -hmm. that you have to make the final decision that they come in to your mind and they can influence the decision, but it doesn't mean that's what you need to do. There is a sense, I think, in which um, almost every moment is uh, is a what can you call it a a, a unique miracle <laughs> that will never be repeated in the whole history of the universe. That is so true. Uh, I, I'm getting used to that now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I had a great time going to a concert and dancing uh, last week, and. It's gone. <laughs> I mean, it's gone. I mean, it, it's like it's. I learn about what you're saying at dance because I can be dancing with somebody or dancing myself, and then it's that moment is gone. These things keep going, mm -hmm. and, and they have them, and phew, they're not there anymore. It 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 is becomes a way of living is to appreciate that here's the now, and that's what it is, and it's not going to be now the next now. Yeah. Yeah. And I suppose really, if, if one can, the now moment is, is so rich. It's so full. It like literally can encompass all time and space. If, if our brains were only powerful enough to allow that. Have you gotten to places where you can experience that? Cause I did it once. Uh huh. Well, you know, I think I come close. I can't say that I've ever experienced what people call cosmic consciousness, where you have like a 360 degree vision of everything. I, I don't believe I've ever experienced that, Bernie. I did once. Uh huh. I did once. It was in my office, uh, talking to somebody and it all went out in all directions, just the way you described it. 360 with my little consciousness in the middle of it, like the center of a, a, a pool of a circular of a pool that it's you drop a rock in. And, but it wasn't like it was just going out. It was all there right now. It was like extending in all directions. Like I could feel um, infinity and not so much eternity, eternity, but it was going off in all ways. I said, wow, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, it was no drugs. It was just like no meditation. It was like in the middle of the, talking with somebody about. Mm -hmm. I, I think I think it that suggests to me now that I mentioned this to you that something about human minds coming together in a way that uh, is right that works where we can experience it with someone that they, other minds can help us get to these places. And, and I'm really I'm really interested in how we are energy packets that we are energy vibrational things and that we send out energy from our minds um, and that these things get picked up. Like I was dancing yesterday with my eyes closed and I look up and there's somebody dancing right in front of me. I hadn't seen her come and then I closed my eyes and I looked again and she wasn't there. Did it really happen? <laughs> <laughs> it was there and it, was, and it wasn't. And it's, it's that dance of the here and now that you're talking about. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Well, dancing is is a wonderful metaphor. You see it being used all all the time for the way in which we navigate through life. What's your favorite way of looking at it? What's what's your favorite way of using dancing? Well, I like the notion of of the dancer and the dance becoming indistinguishable from each other. When I get like that with the with with the music, when I become with the music, and and there's something about wise and having your eyes closed. I mean, uh, to be mystic is to not see with your eyes, and your eyes, the eyes just get in the way of experiencing stuff. I mean, we need them to be able to navigate, but they distract with all the inputs that they create in our brains. Mm -hmm. So with my eyes closed, it hasn't happened quite like this for a while, but I, I'm just there in a different place and open my eyes and I come to being on the dance floor. Uh, and being with the music. It's the, what the dance people say is become one with the music. Become, And that's what I think you're talking about. Yeah. I have to say this. I had an insight, and, and that is that the eyes, no, tell us. the eyes are the great deceivers. We are so conditioned by what we see through our eyes that we think it's real. And actually, uh, we know from physics, for example, that uh, all of these solid objects that uh, the, the universe that comes to us through our eyes and we have this vision of chairs and tables and bodies and houses and automobiles uh, yet physics tells us that most of, uh, not most everything we see is mostly pure vacuum that that's, a good, that's a good one you just came up with um, eyes is the great deceiver just as you're saying yeah. we, we, we can't perceive with our eyes what we need to feel with other senses mm -hmm. yeah 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 that makes it clear why i like to keep my eyes closed um and yeah and and actually deception isn't quite the the right word because the reality that we see through our eyes is is perfectly real but it's not the only reality and we sometimes get uh, seduced into thinking that what is real is only what we see through our eyes. Seeing is believing is an old phrase that's been around for a long time. Yeah. But, but what we're talking about is believing is seeing. Uh -huh. <laughs> when it comes to synchronicities, there's something to that for sure. And to parapsychology in general. Yeah. And you know, one of the interesting questions... Uh, one of the interesting questions is how um, where parapsychology and other synchronicities separate, that all synchronicities are not parapsychology, are not telepathy, clairvoyance, precognition. Um, there, there's something else. There's like um, where um, a parapsychologist, Nancy Zingroni, perhaps you know her, and Carla, her husband, Carlos, um, they, they, they have like, uh, they have like, they teach parapsychology. Oh, of online. course. No, Nancy and Carlos, naturally. Yeah. <laughs> I, I know them well. <laughs> I, I, I thought you might. Yeah. Um, she said, I've only had one synchronicity in my life because the rest, I all think of myself as being the agent because I have agency. She thinks of synchronicities as non-agent or not apparent agent. And you can do super psi, but... Yeah. You know, in other words, that, she says there are things that happen to her rather yes. than things that she in is any way a, a causal uh, factor for. Yes, and her major causal factor is, um, is, is, is in parapsychological things. And she... She has a lot of precognitive experiences, uh, and so she's an agent in the precognitive. That's right. Mm -hmm. But she had one where she was uh, something like you, I guess, was trying to decide what to do with her life, and was in parapsychology in New York City and uh, and studying it or something, and she was getting to be, I don't want to do it. And Carlos took her out to a restaurant that she likes the food of us, Thai or something. And she was kind of grumpy about whether she can continue this kind of work or not. And in walks a guy from the Midwest that uh, Carlos hadn't seen in a long time. 
And you probably know the guy. I don't know who it was. And they, Carlos and this guy talk about parapsychology all real excited. And that turns her around and decides to stay with it. For her, there was no, she wasn't an agent in there. Mm-hmm. But I think she was. Yeah. She and Carlos are really close. Yes. And, and Carlos, I think, is not just an independent entity. Carlos and her are part of the pair, as a lot of people are. And we don't recognize clearly enough how close we are to people we love and who love us. Close in a way that we form a new unit. It's not there's me, there's you, and then there's this us thing. And so Carlos was her, and he probably wanted her to stay. And that he, in parapsychology, and he was the agent, in my way of thinking, in helping to make this happen. Mm-hmm. Now, this leads to one of my favorite um, parapsychological things is bring back Rex Stanford. Rex Stanford, we love you, or at least I do. <laughs> and I, I try to read what you're doing. Yeah. P-A-M-I-R. That, that, Psy-mediated sign- instrumental response. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So he got to be president of one of those associations, and he did a lot, did a lot of like laboratory research on it. So oh, he yeah. can he substantiates the idea, but it doesn't get much play from what I can see in parapsychology. He did it, right. and is, it, nobody has followed it up for from what I can tell. You know that. In fact, well, I've actually even heard that that he's sort of backed away from that concept. I like you. I'm very enthusiastic about it. I think it can explain a, a lot of things, like when a person accidentally takes a wrong turn somewhere and then ends up running into a person that they needed to see but didn't expect to see because they made a what they thought was a mistake. That's very similar to Rex Stanford's example. Yeah. What you, that he uses. Yes. Uh, yes. And that, that's right. I, I have expanded the concept and call it not PMIR. I call it uh, human GPS. <laughs> How to get where you need to be without a map. Uh-huh. And I have a bunch of stories like that. Yeah. Um, and uh, my, the simple one was my dog uh, taking a wrong turn. Uh, and finding him, uh, I I had become like uh, out of control. So I was open then to new inputs. I was in an altered state of consciousness. I could find where he was, mm-hmm. or more more likely find where he was. A mother uh, from Sally Feather, Sally Ryan Feather. She's got several in her uh, her book, The Gift. About one of my favorite is about mother comes home. Where's Ruthie? Ruthie's her six year old daughter. And the babysitter said, I don't know. I think she's next door. The mother runs next door. Ruthie's not here. The mother gets into a state and gets in her car and runs down a a pathway to a a quarry and gets to the edge of the quarry. And there's Ruthie with her friend sitting on the edge of the quarry about to to go swimming or go wading in the quarry. PMIR. Mm -hmm. How to get to where you need to be without a map. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, in the subtitle to your book, you talk about how to use synchronicity and serendipity to enhance your life. Can you give me a clear definition that would distinguish between synchronicity and serendipity? Funny you should ask, uh, Dr. (laughs) Mishla. I'm writing a new book, uh, and this one is going to be uh, sharper clearer than the last one, which was kind of like a case book. Mm. Uh, Connecting with Coincidence was a case book. I was still trying to figure out what I was writing about in kind of uh, literary terms. So what what were my ideas? And this new one um, has a chapter on words, on words and and coincidences. And making the distinction between synchronicity and serendipity is not so easy to do, as you're implying. Part of the reason is uh, my good uh, friend Carl Jung used the word synchronicity in very many different ways. Mm -hmm. And the most bollocksing way he used those terms was one as a description of events, coincidences, meaningful coincidences. Second, as a theory about how they happen. 
the a-causal connecting principle. Right. So here he was using the same word for what what is what happens and how it happens. Mm -hmm. That's not clarity. But what I've come to realize is that he was recognizing, perhaps unconsciously, that he really didn't know what he was talking about yet. That the theory and the and the um, events themselves needed to be better distinguished, and that was the best he could do right then. And uh, I take that now in, in a much like clearer, uh, more accepting way. When we talk about synchronicity, the a causal connecting principle is the theory part of it, and that's a long discussion that I don't think will get us very far. Um, things connected by meaning. Uh, it's it's spe very speculative and it's kind of fun, but. The, what is synchronicity and as events or an event? That's more the question that I want to answer from what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Synchronicity as an event um, tends to be, for Jungian thinking, uh, a mental event correlating with an external event, an environmental event. That tends to be the usual Jungian way of thinking. It's not the only kind of coincidence there is. There's telepathy, and there's the seriality thing I was mentioning earlier of thing things that you can see things in a series that are observable by others. That did, was not included with Jung. So the Jungian definition has two general parts to it. One that includes uh, parapsychological events, which Jung did, and this mind thing, mind environment thing. And another that is more restrictive within Jungian circles, which is any meaning, any coincidences that helps with individuation. And that's the narrow definition of synchronicity. And then the others I've, I've tried to be able to say more generally. Serendipity. Did you, did you know there's a thing called the Serendipity Society? No, I didn't. It's primarily European. I, I had a guy from uh, from uh, the, the Denmark, uh, University of Copenhagen, on my show the, a couple of weeks ago. And it's part of a network of people in Europe and in the United States that are studying academically, Jeff, academically studying serendipity. Mm -hmm. They're trying to be able to show how it's useful and how... It can be developed and how it can be encouraged. So serendipity falls under the term of meaningful coincidence for, for sure. But it tends to mean something like uh, looking for one thing and finding something else. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are a lot of variations on that. My favorite version of that one, looking for something and finding something else, was Christopher Columbus think, looking for uh, India. And he died thinking he found it, uh, but he did find the new world. Uh, if you did think Leif Erikson wasn't there first, but uh, Columbus didn't know what he was, didn't know what he had found, but he had found something else. Viagra is the often used um, version of that, where they're using uh, Viagra for uh, a blood pressure pill. Oh yeah, and and then the guys didn't want to give it back to the researchers. <laughs> <laughs> and <you> how come? <laughs> they found that, that it was good for erectile dysfunction. So mm -hmm. that's uh, uh, an, there are several other versions of, of that, um, of serendipity. Another one is like noticing something in one context and seeing how it can be useful in another context. Mm. And a, a guy uh, was walking around with his dog um, and noticed that these certain kind of burrs would stick to the fur of the dog and his clothes. And he wondered how uh, that thing worked, that it stuck to things. So he looked at the way the burr worked, and uh, out came Velcro. Very One thing, in, yeah. in this, this is informed observation or sagacity. Lots uh, of inventions uh, occur that way. That's Serendipity is very much an invention thing, mm -hmm. where you find things, discover things accidentally. Yeah. And so it differs from, from synchronicity in, in that way, is that it's more technological, it's more like uh, uh, scientific. You find things, 
in, in ways that you don't really expect. Mm -hmm. as, as I recall, uh, I, I hope I get this correct, Charles Goodyear, uh, the tire magnet, invented the vulcanization of rubber process by accidentally spilling one of his, or, or accidentally spilling some chem chemicals into a, um, a pot of rubber and then discovering that it had, it had all kinds of new properties as a result. Right. And there's a lot of stuff that gets discovered like that. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's, a, there's a book of, uh, called um, about medical serendipity that's filled with medical versions of the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, another, another medical serendipity thing, um, which is just the right time thing, is like a, a priest is walking around the hospital um, and uh, collapses with a, a heart attack uh, in front of an elevator, and the elevator door opens and a cardiology walk, cardiologist walks out and knows just what to do right then. Mm -hmm. uh, and that happens in medicine a lot, where you're looking for one thing sometimes. You find, like, like I had a patient who was uh, bipolar and didn't like the idea, but she had diplopia, double vision, and uh, I sent her to uh, get a, a CAT scan, and she had a brain tumor in the middle of her brain. And she said, oh, that's better which I wouldn't have agreed with her about, but huh. looking for one thing and finding something else. You uh, are very skillful, I think, in your book at pointing out the distinctions between a uh, serendipity and a synchronicity and also pointing out the uh, the ways in which people can learn how to develop normal psychological skills to help them take advantage of these things when they occur, to notice them when they occur. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that's, that's my job. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm a psychiatrist. Um, it's clinical. I, I am trying to use a, a relatively new tool or idea to help people. That's, 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 that's what I do. You you do it well, and you you are Thank really you, now. I would say the uh, the leading spokesperson uh, I'm aware of uh, suggesting that this this is a handle that by which we can learn to improve our lives. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And that's why um, I have an alter ego. When you talk about handles, I have another handle. Uh, I am Doctor Coincidence. <laughs> Dr. Coincidence. I like that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, Dr. Bernie Beitman, it's been a real pleasure being with you, having this discussion. It's been uh, enlightening and uh, rewarding, and I want to encourage our uh, viewers to take a look at your book, Connecting with Coincidence, and also your podcast, Connecting with Coincidence, and your blog uh, on the Psychology Today website. Thank you very much, Jeff. This is really fun talking to you. I'm glad we could like look at each other and get a little more heart-heart connection. It's really good. Thank yeah, you. It, it's a real pleasure. I hope we get to do it a few more times before we're okay. done. <laughs> Thanks, Jeff. We'll do it.